Jim Williams, uh, the Navy. I was an officer and I um, uh, went into NROTC my junior year in college. Um, but my vintage, I graduated in 1968. So the Vietnam War was, uh, I don't know if raging is the right word, but uh, the, the draft was on. <coughs> and if you weren't in college, then you, you had to go into the military. <coughs> so all of my friends, I was in a fraternity at Indiana University, and all of my pledge brothers, there were 32 of us, all of us were in the service. And in 1970, five of us had dinner in Saigon because we were, we were within reach of, um, of Saigon and we were able to organize ourselves and go to dinner one night in Saigon. At Indiana University, they had NROTC that was required and they only had Army and um, Air Force. And I, for some reason, I didn't, I didn't uh, like either one of those. And then um, I began to realize I was going to have to do something because I was going to graduate from, um, from college. And I saw the flight program in the Navy, and so I was able to switch schools to Miami of Ohio. It's that way. A lot of people don't know. It's in the, on the, it's, it's in the Midwest. And they had an NROTC program, and uh, I, I went there as a flight option. And so that's why I, I picked the Navy. Well, eight days after I graduated, I was in flight school, and I went through the first aircraft. And I was just telling this story that um, I asked them uh, when we were going to get our parachute training. And they said, well, we don't give parachute training to our flight uh, students anymore. And I said, well, gee, that means the first time um, I'm going to be in a parachute is if somebody shoots me down or if my plane flames out. And they said, uh, it was a gunny sergeant, a Marine gunny sergeant was in charge of our PT. And he said, yes, sir, Mr. Williams. And so I said, well, I'm not going to do this. And um, because they, they can't make you fly. <coughs> and um, so I, I dropped on request and they reviewed my commission and they said, if you quit doing this, you'll quit everything that you ever tried to do. And I said, well, you won't give me parachute training. And they said, what makes you think you're worthy of being a naval officer? And I said, I am a naval officer. I was commissioned by the president six months ago when I graduated. <clears throat> so then they said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I'd like to be on a destroyer. And because when you're in ROTC, they teach you how to uh, navigate and op how ships operate. So I went on a destroyer for a year and a half. It was deployed in the Western Pacific. And um, then I volunteered to go to Vietnam because the captain had been a political warfare officer in Vietnam. And I thought I was um, a history graduate. Uh, political science, and I thought that would be a good, a good uh, thing for me to do. So I volunteered to go, and I went as a uh, political warfare advisor. In in our world, uh, in the 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 boys or the men were subject to draft, and the and the girls were not. So uh, when they graduated, uh, uh, for example, w one of my girlfriends at Miami of Ohio went to New York. And, you know, so the girls got to do what they wanted to do and the boys had to go into the military. So um, it wasn't particularly difficult, I don't think, you know, because you, you, know, you, had, you had work to do and um, you had a place to sleep and they gave you food and, you know, so you, it, it wasn't that bad. What, what was wrong with it was that you were kind of stuck, you know, so you, you had to do the next three to five years of your life, you had to do that. I believe in a strong defense, but I'm not a very big proponent of war. And it's not just because I was there and, you know, there, there was a lot of um, death around you. In Vietnam, you know, we, uh, I think a million people served in Vietnam, a million Americans, and we had 55,000 uh, people killed, both men and women. Um, but we killed two million Vietnamese. And so there's a lot of, you know, when you go to war, you have to pay attention to, um, uh, to what can happen as you conduct the war. Uh, Vietnam was a difficult one because it was, um, there was, uh, do you know about the causa belli of war? Do you know what that is? That's uh, a Latin term for the cause of uh, war. And um, so, for example, in 
World War II, the Germans attacked Poland because they said the Polish attacked them, but actually the Germans faked the attack themselves and then they used that as a reason to attack Poland. And in our case, our government said that the Vietnamese had attacked a U.S. Navy destroyer called, uh, I'm not going to remember the name, <laughs> but uh, it was, it's the Gulf of Tonkin incident, and it was fake. Uh, and Lyndon Johnson, who was the president at the time, plus probably a, a, a large number of other people in the government knew that it was fake. And uh, this didn't come out until a professor, I think he was at Harvard, Daniel Ellsberg, um, uh, released secret documents called the um, Pentagon Papers. Uh, I don't think people are expected to read them because it was 7,000 pages long. But, <laughs> but in this Gulf of Tonkin uh, incident was disclosed in the Pentagon Papers. This is a book um, about um, George Patton. But uh, George Patton was a great, uh, a, a great uh, Army um, uh, general, and this book, whether you, I'm not selling Bill O'Reilly's uh, politics because you know he's, he's kind of a, a, a political guy, but the book is great and it really it gives you a good sense of, uh, of how these things work, and particularly how it worked in World War II, so I'll give you that one. This one is a book called Johnny Got His Gun. You ever heard of this? Dalton Trumbo was a screenwriter in uh, Hollywood. And do you guys know about Joe McCarthy, who was accusing people of being um, communist? Yeah. And uh, Dalton Trumbo was blacklisted in Hollywood, but he was also a pacifist, and he was a communist as well. And so I'm not selling his communism either, but it's an interesting book about, about war and the concept of war. So I, I give that to you. You can, this one, is a little more friendly, although it's the same topic. It's called Catch-22 by Joseph Heller. And, and this is where uh, one enlisted person was trying to get out of the service by taking a thing called a Section 8, which means if you're crazy, you can't serve. But, <laughs> but in, in here, the book says that if you want to get out, that means you're not crazy, so you, you can't do a Section 8. But it's also a great description of the military and, and what can happen and how it works. This is another one, Norman Mailer, The Naked and the Dead. Have you heard of this book? No. Norman Mailer went to Harvard, ironically, and he was, he's dead now, but he was prominent in the 60s and 70s, I would say. And... Um, I really think he was 21 years old when he wrote this book, and it, it's amazing to me. Look how thick that book is. He's 21. <laughs> you guys are 15, so he's only six years older than you are. And he was in the Army for two years, and this is such a personal account of what it's like to be in an Army, in, 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 a, in, an army in a platoon. I mean, it's, it's brilliant, and um, so I give that to you. This is a book written by Eric Maria Remarquet, and it's all called all, all Quiet on the Western Front. Have you heard of this? And this, this is an anti-war book. Uh, I'm not anti-war. I think, I, I, I'm anti-war, but I believe in a strong defense because if you don't have a strong defense, once you get out there in the world, you'll, you'll realize that there are bad people out there and so you have to you have, to have a, a good defense. But whether it should be war or not is another question. And this is, this is an anti-war book, but I give that to you if you're interested to read that. I bought two movies for you. Um, one is a movie called Full Metal Jacket, and it's written by Stan, or it was produced by, uh, directed by Stanley Kubrick. Do you know who he is? Did you ever see The Shining? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So this is what it was like to be in Vietnam, this one. The, it, you can watch this, and that's what it was like. I was not in a platoon. I was in a, I was on a boat with uh, 60 Vietnamese and myself. Uh, I once went for six weeks without seeing another American. Um, I weighed 175 pounds when I got on the boat, and I weighed 145 when I got off. Um, and we visited villages in, uh, in, in what was called i Corps, so it was near the, the DMZ. And um, it was near Khe Sanh, that's what this one is about, and this was Marines and, and uh, Army guys who were caught up in a the battle there. Um, Great, uh, great movie if you want to 
have a sense of what it was like, I give you this one. I was hoping you could show that in your class, but I'm not sure. And then there's another one called Platoon. Have you heard of this one? Now this one is not kind of a reality thing. It's more of a story about the guys uh, in the platoon, but a lot of it is, uh, this was directed by Oliver Stone, who was in a platoon in Vietnam, and so a lot of it is, is pretty real. But I played golf in Vietnam at the Tansanut Air Force Base, and uh, I had an M16 in my golf bag, and I was playing with um, my fraternity brother, who happened to be uh, an intelligence officer for General Creighton Abrams, and we would play golf in, in Saigon. It was kind of an ironic uh, thing. Yeah, it, it, you had a six-year commitment. Everyone had a six-year commitment. But if you were in Vietnam, well, first of all, I was a reserve officer, so I, I only had to do three years. Seems like a lifetime when you're 22. <laughs> but um, uh, because I went to Vietnam, I was able to go into the reserves, and I also didn't have to go to any meetings or anything. And my only protest against the war was that I turned down a promotion to lieutenant which is the same as a captain in the army and uh, three years later I received a letter from the uh, secretary of the navy saying that since I had twice failed promotion that I was uh, discharged and they thanked me for my service. When you came back you know people weren't very happy with you so um, um, it took me about a year and a half to figure out how to get back into the society and um, so people didn't get help um, and I'm not even sure that anybody knew what to do you know because if you take if you take a 23 year old and you put them in a war zone and people are trying to kill them and then they're trying to kill other people um, which I meant I mentioned before that you know we I wasn't angry with the Vietnamese and yet their government was doing to them what our government was doing to us and in my view the governments failed and, and then they put their 18-year-olds, gave each side a rifle, and then you're supposed to shoot, it, shoot at each other. So that's kind of the, uh, uh, the irrationality of war once it gets there. But um, um, it's hard to come down from that. In, in the Civil War, what they did was they gave veterans uh, farms, and then people, you know, they farmed for the rest of their career. But in our case, they, they didn't do that. So I, I went to um, graduate school at Indiana University. I studied communication. Um, and finally, I just realized that uh, I needed to go to work. And uh, my father worked for Prudential, and I was able to get a job in Chicago. And so in effect, what you do is you start over. Uh, my grandfather was uh, a Republican in uh, <laughs> World War, or no, a Republican in Indiana. He was a barber, and he, uh, uh, was appointed the state clerk in the 1960s um, by the governor and so I was familiar with with that background. I also had an uncle who was killed in World War II in a tank and so my grandmother and her family they were a gold star family what they call a gold star family so I was aware of you know World War II and I was always interested in politics um, the other thing is that when you go to college, um, you, you know, sometimes people are happy that you know what you're going to do when you go to college. But the other, th the other thing is you could spend the first two years kind of figuring out what to do. And uh, so for me, I started out as a pre-dent. I was going to be a dentist. And then I just found that history was too fascinating. So I ended up being a history major, and that's how I got involved. And then here, uh, when we moved here, um, my wife's parents are in Cambridge, so we moved from New York here to, so she could help them when they, they o got older. And our neighbor invited us to a coffee for um, Bobby Reardon. Do you guys know Bobby Reardon? He's a swimming coach. And so I, um, I worked on Bobby Reardon's campaign and was able to hold a sign down at the, at the bridge. And then um, Bobby worked in administration, and he said that um, they were having people come to work for finance committees. And so I interviewed for a position on one of the finance committees, and I ended up working for um, uh, uh, the treasurer, Floyd Carmen, on his committee. And um, I was asking them 
I, I also ran for town meeting member and was elected to town meeting. And then I read the financial statements of the town and I was concerned about the pension fund and the health care fund. And I was talking to people about it, but I wasn't getting the kind of answers that I thought were reasonable. And so I'm walking my dog one day, Sumi, you know, Sumi, <laughs> walking Sumi, and I decided I was going to run for selectman. And um, so I went to Staples and bought two signs. One said Williams for selectman, and the other one said a better way for a better Belmont. And um, about three weeks later, someone knocked on my door. His name is Phil Thayer, and they were trying to get solar into Belmont. And he said, so are you a two-issue candidate or do you want to try to win? And I said, well, what do you have in mind? And so what happened was the, the solar people then helped my campaign and we ended up winning uh, three years ago. And then yesterday I was elected uh, chairman of the Board of Selectmen. So now I have a hard year coming <laughs> ahead or a harder year. This is a letter from John Kerry telling me that they found my uh, military records because when I um, came here and wanted to get um, uh, military benefits, which there's really not a lot that apply to somebody like me, but um, they told me that they had no record of my service. And this was such a big part of my early life that um, I, I couldn't believe that they couldn't find my, my records. And um, what happened was they had a fire in uh, Tennessee where the records are kept. And um, so I thought, I thought that my records had been burnt, but fortunately they were able to find them. So there, there they are. You can't just blindly allow um, your society to, to go to war. You, you have to pay attention. And um, so I'll give you this because they're giving me a signal that we're out of time. And we'll, we'll do this off camera. It'll only take a minute. Um, so thank you. No one else has ever asked me to tell them anything about you know what uh, what this experience was like, and of course I you know my friends, all of my friends from college who were involved in this. We we talk about it. We have a reunion every year, not just for the military, but um, so there's there's plenty of people in our age group to talk about it. But usually uh, I've never had a young a group of young people ask me. So I thank you.